We're going to continue um, the discussion of, we're going to finish the molecular biology part today. I don't know, we're probably going to start some talking about metabolism, just a few things. I'm going to give you the quiz, which take home, okay, bring it tomorrow, genetics. Um, now, we talked a lot about the gene expression. And we talked a lot that gene expression is linked to the phenotype, right? Certain genes are expressed at a certain moment. An expression of genes is often kind of controlled by the environment. Certain genes are expressed because of changes in the environment. Remember that? For instance, we saw the changing colors of the colonies of Ceratia recessans. You know, when, when cells become less abundant, they turn color from white to pink. Okay, so changes in the environment promote the changes in the phenotype. But the question is, what? how do the cells do that? Okay, turns out that they have various regulatory mechanisms. Uh, regulatory mechanisms that are incorporated in the DNA or RNA. And we're going to talk about two of those mechanisms, the operons and the riboswitches. Okay, so genes generally uh, can serve two functions. Genes can be structural, which means they encode components of the cell or they encode various enzymes. And genes can be regulatory. Regulatory genes um, may or may not produce proteins, but importantly, regulatory genes are responsible for changing the expression when the environment changes. They regulate, right? So in operons, regulatory genes control the expression of structural genes. Okay? Does that make sense? Now, what is operon? Often, genes with a similar function, genes with a related function, are going to be organized in a cluster on the chromosome. For example, there is an operon called lactose operon. It contains genes that are necessary to metabolize lactose, a milk sugar. Does that make sense? Because there's more than one enzyme required to perform a, a lactose metabolism. Genes that encode all those enzymes are organized, clustered together. And that cluster of related genes, functionally related genes, is called an operon. Does that make sense? So each operon consists of the structural genes, promoter and operator sequences, which function we're going to discuss later, and sometimes regulatory genes that additionally control the transcription, the genetic expression of the genes that are the part of the operon. Another interesting mechanism to regulate the gene expression is the riboswitch. It looks and sounds way more complicated than it is actually. So riboswitch can control the transcription and translation. Okay. Look at you all you'll operate it light switch, right? You know how light switch works. Which positions it usually takes? On and off, right? Same goes for Iba switch. It can either be in on position or off position. Okay. So when Ribo switch, let's say particular specific Ribo switch regulates transcription. Ribo switch is in the on position. The structure 
of the RNA that is produced as the result of transcription is such that transcription occurs. It goes on. Does that make sense? When a certain small molecule, and we will talk which small molecule it is, some small molecule binds to the riboswitch and puts it in the off position. The mRNA, the transcript, forms so-called terminator loop, which leads to the dissociation of RNA polymerase from DNA and RNA, and transcription stops. Does that make sense? I'll let you, I'll, I'll give you like a few seconds to sing it in and think about this. You have some kind of a chemical inside the cell. It binds to RNA. That's why it's riboswitch. Changes RNA structure. The change in the structure stops transcription. No transcription, no gene expression. Does that make sense? Huh? Say it one more time. The tryptophan or yeah. tryptoph you probably talking about the tryptophan apron. The transcription via the riboswitch. It is possible. But we'll talk about we'll talk about the tryptophan operon and you will tell me if it sounds familiar. Okay, but we'll get to the point it doesn't have to be on the tryptophan. We'll get we'll we'll talk about what this small molecule can be. But before that, translation. How can it switch translation? What is the what is the translation? Synthesis of the protein and what serves as a template? mRNA. So if the small molecule binds to the certain riboswitch and that changes the structure of mRNA so that ribosome cannot bind anymore, no translation happens. No translation, no gene expression. Does that make sense? Okay, so I have small molecule that binds to the riboswitch. What this small molecule can be? What is the most common regulation system in the living organisms? What type of feedback is most common? Negative feedback, right? Which means that the system sort of resists the changes, okay? Now, think about this. Imagine that you have gene, okay? Gene is being expressed, and what is the ultimate result of a gene expression? A protein. Let's say this protein is some kind of an enzyme which produces a small molecule, a chemical say, I don't know, tryptophan. If tryptophan accumulates in large quantities, it can interact with the riboswitch, turning off its own production via ter by turning off the expression of the gene that's responsible for the tryptophan production. Does that make sense? So ribo switches are essentially regulated in the negative feedback matter. Does that make sense? A lot of those small molecules are produced by the proteins, okay, that, that are expressed by the certain genes, or they byproducts or metabolites and whatnot. Does that make sense? Now another way to regulate the gene expression is, is the operons. So there are two types of operons, inducible and repressible. An example of inducible operon is the lactose operon. 
Lactose operon is the group of genes that, when expressed, they produce proteins necessary for the lactose metabolism. Does that make sense so far? Bless you. Normally, when there is no lactose in the environment, the protein called repressor blocks transcription of the lactose operon. Does that make sense? There's no transcription. That's no lactose here. Repressor blocks the transcription. When lactose is present, it binds to the repressor protein and the complex of repressor and lactose dissociate from the DNA. Now, RNA polymerase can transcribe the genes that are in the operon. Does that make sense? These genes that are in the operon, they produce proteins necessary for the lactose metabolism. So these proteins, these enzymes, will, will break down the lactose. When they break down lactose, what happens to the lactose levels in the cell? It goes down. As it goes down, what's going to happen to that complex? Repressor and lactose. It's going to, it's numbers, yeah, exactly. It's going to be less and less. So where are all the free repressor molecules are going to be? They're going to stick back to what? To the operator side, right? You reduce the amount of lactose, you get more free repressor molecules that will stick back to the operator sequence and will block the transcription. So it's a, it's a negative feedback. You have more substrate, you have less repression, you produce enzymes that break down substrate. When substrate's gone, okay, Repressor goes back to the DNA, stops the transcription. Does that make sense? This is the inducible. So inducible protein, inducible operon is controlled by the, yes. So Think about this. I'm a bacteria. Okay. And... In the environment, there's no lactose. Do I really need to make enzymes that break down lactose if there is no lactose available? No. So I don't want to waste energy, to waste resources on it. Lactose becomes available. It's a valuable nutritional source. Okay? So lactose acts as a switch. Okay? It interacts with the receptor, oh, sorry, with the repressor and removes the repressor from the DNA. And as a bacteria, I start to produce enzymes that I need to use lactose as the nutritional source. Does that make sense so far? As I use it, what happens to the lactose levels? Exactly. When I use all the lactose and it's gone again, What's going to happen to this complex? Lactose is gone. There's no complex anymore, right? Because there's no lactose. So repressor is going to go back to the DNA. So I don't spend resources and energy on making proteins that I don't need since I just ate all lactose around me. If lactose will become available again, those proteins will be produced again. Does that make sense? Okay, so inducible operon is regulated by the substrate. Okay, when substrate binds to the repressor, repressor dissociates from the DNA and transcription is initiated. Um, yes, yes, and actually the 
expression of lactose or prone is, um, as far as I know, not as straightforward as just using the opera. It's also about the availability. So if glucose is dominant and is sufficient, then lactose is not going to be used. Yes? It's a great question. Um, I bet some of them can. I bet some of them can. I don't know about which ones can, but I think some of them should be able to make it. Okay. Um, so that's inducible operon. Another type of operon is repressible. And that's the tryptophan operon that we're going to talk about. So amino acid tryptophan is a result, the product of enzymatic reaction, not a substrate. Right? So when there is no tryptophan in the cell, which is which is needed, okay, the repressor is free floating, it doesn't doesn't bind to the DNA. And transcription happens, and genes that are necessary for the tryptophan synthesis are being expressed. And when these genes are expressed, okay, what's going to happen to the tryptophan levels? These genes, genes that are needed for tryptophan synthesis, tryptophan levels are going to increase, yeah, because these this, this proteins, these gene products, are going to start making tryptophan. Does that make sense? Okay. Tryptophan levels rise and rise and rise and rise. And when they reach certain level, tryptophan binds, starts to bind to the repressor. Okay. And the complex of tryptophan with the repressor binds to the operator sequence. Does that make sense? When it bound when it is bound to the operator sequence, can transcription happen? Can transcription occur? No, it cannot, because it simply blocks the way for RNA polymerase. Okay? When there is no transcription, gene products are not made. Tryptophan levels will start to decrease until they reach the level at which there will be not enough tryptophan to form the complex with a repressor. So repressor will start to dissociate and the genes will be expressed again. Does that make sense? So in case of in case of repressible operon, it is regulated by the product. Okay? In the absence of the product, repressor is dissociated from the DNA and transcription can occur. But in the presence of the product, the complex between the repressor and the product binds the operator and transcription stops. Does that make sense? So you have to understand the difference between the repressible and inducible operons. And I'm going to ask you questions about this and I think uh, you can see the you will you will be able to see the example of such question in the uh, quiz that I'm going to give you today. Right, so understand which molecule regulates the operon, whether it's a substrate, whether it's a product, what kind of operon it is. Me a question, yes. Say it one more time. On the left. On the left, top left. So this is when you have no substrate. So essentially, there is no transcription. When you add substrate, there is transcription. Okay. Don't hesitate to ask questions, please. Okay, is that 
set clear to understand the difference between these two. Now we're going to start today discussion of metabolism. I believe you have taken biology previously, okay, so you know pretty good deal about metabolism, so it shouldn't be terribly hard for you. What we're going to discuss in this chapter, we're going to talk about different metabolic strategies in terms of the sources of energy and sources of nutrients, mainly carbon. We're going to talk about oxidation and reduction reactions that produce and consume energy. We're going to talk about the cellular respiration, different types, aerobic, anaerobic. Uh, we're going to compare those uh, two processes to fermentation and we're going to look at the photosynthesis, what it's like. Right? So, how do we call all the chemical processes in the cell? Metabolism. Yes. And metabolism essentially It's composed of two parts, okay? All processes can be separated into the processes of synthesis and processes of degradation. How do we call degradation? Catabolism and synthesis, anabolism. Can you give me an example of anabolic process? Process of synthesis. on like all cell scale. We talked about them. Synthesis of something. Huh? Protein? Protein, yeah. What were you suggesting? Polysaccharide. Great. Anything. You're building something bigger, okay? You're connecting. It's, it's anabolic process. Protein synthesis is anabolic. Um, RNA, polysaccharide synthesis is anabolic. What about catabolic process? Any example of catabolic process, process of degradation in the cell? Yeah. Yeah. You break down complex carbohydrates to the simple sugars. Break down proteins to amino acids. Does that make sense? Now, generally, turns out, catabolic processes, they often release energy. Anabolic processes, well, most of them, require energy. Does that make sense? Now, the organisms, microbial organisms, not only microbial organisms, can be uh, classified in terms of the metabolic strategies based on the source of energy and the source of carbon. Okay, what do we need carbon for? Hmm? Everything. everything, yeah, biosynthesis of everything. Okay, all biological components of the cell, biochemical components. Sugars, amino acids, lipids, you name it. They consist not main, well, it's hard. well, they must have carbon, right? Not just carbon, organic carbon. And to build a cell, you need energy. It's actually a statement, if you think, if you kind of mull it over a little, you realize that this is the statement, it's, it's, it's obvious. But it would be awfully hard and probably awfully long proof of it. Okay? But let's, we know that we need energy to build something new. Correct? Where can we get energy? Where do you get energy? Food. So food consists of what? 
Hmm? Carbs, something else. Fats. Protein spots. Can you name them all like with one word? Okay. And nutrients. Are they like physical or what they are? Is that I'm kind of trying to push you? Each nutrient consists of what? Chemicals, molecules, okay? So we take our energy from chemicals, essentially, right? Does everything take energy from chemicals? Not really. It's a huge group of organisms that do not use chemicals as a source of energy. Energy. What do they use? Huh? Light. You can use light. We call them plants. Your plants, photos, photosynthetic organisms use light as the source of energy does that make sense and actually if you think about it when we okay humans are often easier to use as an example for nutritional strategies because it's easier to relate to ourselves than to relate to i don't know a fungus what do you eat No, seriously, just very on a very basic. What do you eat? What did you have for breakfast today at oatmeal? I had oatmeal and egg. Where did oatmeal come from? The plants. Where did egg come from? Chicken, animals, right? So I ate a plant which used light, sunlight as the source of energy. And I ate what was supposed to be a chicken but never became a chicken okay came from the chicken can okay, chicken what where did, where did where did the chicken get energy from plants and they got it from light does that make sense if you would look at any trophic chain food chain on earth and you trace it to the very beginning it ultimately starts with light with yeah with few exceptions on the ocean floor there's not a lot of light so there's there's chemistry there okay but here around us on the surface it ultimately starts with light okay may include many steps so organisms that use light as the source of energy we call them phototrophs organisms that use chemistry okay whether it's organic chemistry or inorganic chemistry we call them chemotrophs does that make sense now what about carbon where do we take carbon for biosynthesis from huh do we know on, on pieces of chalk or what what do we take carbon I had oatmeal and egg this morning where did I take carbon oatmeal and egg okay that's where I took my carbon from so we take it from food oatmeal is it organic no I mean not in whole food sense in chemical in proper sense is that organic yeah yeah organic egg organic so I used organic carbon to satisfy my need in organic carbon. Organisms that get carbon from organic source are called heterotrophs. Make sense? Okay. Organisms that use inorganic carbon and convert it to organic are called autotrophs plants what they use as a source of carbon no 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 it's source of energy source of carbon what do they use as a source of carbon plants no what do they take carbon 
Hmm? The CO2 in the air, right? CO2. CO2 is inorganic molecule. So plants are autotrophs. Autotrophs, there's also a saying, they fix carbon. Okay? They take carbon from inorganic sources and convert that inorganic carbon into the organic one. Does that make sense? Okay, now, the total, the, the compound name for plants based on the source of energy and source of nutrients will be photoautotrophs. Does that make sense? They use light and inorganic source of carbon. Okay. There are photoheterotrophs. They use light as a source of energy, but they flourish on the organic source of carbon. Most of the microorganisms, all fungi, the vast majority of bacteria, all protozoa, achemoheterotrophs or organotrophs, okay, they use organic chemicals as a source of carbon think about think about fungus growing on the dead tree sorry well fungus mushroom whatever you want to call it okay it grows on the dead tree it uses organic carbon in that dead tree as a source of energy and as a source of carbon for biosynthesis does that make sense okay there are very interesting organisms that are called chemoautotrophs or lithotrophs. So let's take a glance. So autotroph, what does that mean? What does it take uh, carbon from? Inorganic sources, right? And chemo means that it takes energy from the, from the chemicals, not from the light. So these guys, okay, microbes that can oxidize a number of inorganic chemicals these are present bless you in the for instance springs hot springs um, volcanic springs at the ocean floor there's no light there's very scarce organic material around so what they do they use chemical inorganic chemical reactions as a source of energy and then they channel this energy in the reaction so they can they can consume say carbonate ions or co2 from the environment okay in the water environment actually and they can convert that inorganic carbon into the molecules like amino acids or sugars does that make sense so before we moving on we have some time to talk about other stuff you have to understand the categories so if i ask you the organism that uses light as the source of energy and organic carbon as the source of carbon organic matter is the source of carbon tell me this is photoheterotroph okay does that make sense and vice versa if i ask you chemoheterotrophs are Do you really have to know all these categories? No. But few things I want you to know. This statement. Okay. Plants algae. They are photoautotrophs. Right? Am I clear? Now, <coughs> when we say energy, what do we mean by that? What kind of transmits, what carries energy in light? How do we call the light particles? Photons. Photon is like a cannonball. You, I hope you agree with me that like flying cannonball has certain energy. Okay, so photon it's flying as an energy and then it hits something in the plant. Question? 
Okay. You more than welcome to ask. Okay. So this photon hits something. Okay. What what does it energize in the cell? Well, in plano algae cell, algal cell. Deeper, which particle gets energized? Photon has to hit the particle. It's really small. Some really elementary particle gets energized. Huh? Electron. Electron gets energized. When ATP is broken down, this energy, what does it get energized? Electrons. Pretty much all energy related reactions, okay, energy transfer in the cell somehow involves the electrons, okay. Practically, the cell extracts energy from high energy electrons. Does that make sense? So it has to be able to take energy from high energy electrons, okay, and steals the energy and those electrons become low energy. Does that make sense what I just said? So you have electrons that have high energy level cells somehow extracts that energy and electrons become low in terms of energetic level. Does that make sense? You can do it by transferring electrons from one molecule to another. How do we call reactions in which electrons go from one molecule to another? Actually, the title of the slide, we call them redox, reduction and oxidation. Okay. Redu huh? Re redox reactions. It's the uh, electrons being transferred from one molecule to another. Okay, that's the definition of redox reaction. When electrons are being transferred. Now, when the molecule loses electrons, this molecule is what? oxidized. And when molecule gains electrons, it is reduced. You have to understand there's there's no reduction without oxidation and vice versa. So I'm trying to see if I can reach Shell. So if, if Shell could help me, you can do that. So this is the electron, okay? And I'm going to lose the electron, and you're going to gain it. So what happens to me? I'm being oxidized, and Michelle is reduced, right? So she is oxidant, and I'm reductant. Does that make sense? Now, this, so you see, this is going to be the reaction of oxidation of me, and reduction of Michelle. Does that make sense? Thank you. One isn't possible without another. Does that make sense? It is reduced, but it oxidizes. Yeah, so electron accept acceptor is oxidant. We call it oxidant, okay? Electron donor is reductant. You have to be familiar with that terminology. So I'm going to ask you about this. Okay, now. Electrons. How chemically active are they? Huh? Extremely, just crazy. Okay, you cannot, you cannot <laughs> let, it's impossible to have free electrons. Well, yeah, okay. It's really, you cannot have free electron. It's going gonna, it's gonna to do something. It's going to, you know, reduce something immediately. Okay, right away. 
but you have to, in a cell, reactions of oxidation and reduction, redox reactions, happen in different parts. So you somehow have to carry electrons from one point to another. Does that make sense? For this, cells use electron carriers. You have heard these names. NAD, FADH, okay? So this is the example of NAD, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, whatever. You don't need to know the long name. I just want you to know the acronym, NAD. When NAD acquires electron, what happens to it? Is it getting reduced or oxidized? When it acquires electron, it is reduced. And then when it delivers electron, when electron is needed, okay, and then gives it away, it is oxidized. It's like a taxi, okay? Electron sits on the electron carrier, gets transported to the proper place, departs. Does that make sense? So NAD is essentially, so NADH is reduced form. Okay? NAD is oxidized form. YH, Y proton, Y NAD has to acquire proton together with electrons. What is the charge of electron? What's the charge of a proton? They neutralize each other. Does that make sense? That's it. That's electron is accompanied by the proton. Right? Now, this scheme here actually pretty well describes the reduction oxidation. Okay? Now, the when electron goes from one molecule to another, imagine it kind of rolls down the slide. Okay, when it rolls down the slide, if you will, if you will put something on top of the slide and you will push it down and it will roll down, is it going to have energy at the bottom? Kinetic energy. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, you biking and you you roll down the hill. Yeah, you keep going because you have energy at the bottom. You have kinetic. You acquire kinetic energy at the bottom of the hill. Okay, so when electrons go from high energy state to low energy state, they release some that difference. Okay, and the difference cell has to keep it in some form, and for this cell, utilizes ATP. Okay, so that energy energy of the cell or catabolism is stored in the molecule of ATP, in the gamma and beta phosphate bonds. It's a way to accumulate energy. ATP synthesis requires energy, but then when you break it down, that energy is released back. Does that make sense? Like It's like investment. It's energy investment. You invest energy in the ATP molecules. When you break down ATP molecules, your invest your investment pays off. Okay, you can use that energy then. Does that make sense? We're going to discuss why ATP is why do you need to have a currency in the cell? Okay. Um, what I want you to do now.